in a way that's worthy to the written literature of Tolkien. piece of modern English folklore to the screen. Nobody's ever shot uh, three huge movies in a row before. And... and the reverse, I have to say. ...for five years and deliver it onto the world... ...the idea that this armour had been... Some who were not born to die, whom age and disease could not touch, were slain. But Gilgalad was slain. You've painted a lonely mountain. Echenin, that's from the verb echedo. Plural, not singular. That's right. It's Sindarin, the language of elves. Oh, How is it? Very well. Well, very, very odd. I mean, more than usual. Last week he wrote his will and started roaring with laughter. Ran no, out. No, food and drink will be flowing on it. Straight up. He's part of all the wine. Hi, as I go over my lines, in embarrassment. <laughs> yeah. There was an idea of Fran Walsh, or, or was it Philippa Burns, uh, that uh, Gandalf should have um, just given up smoking, and all the scenes in the cart uh, involved him not smoking, but um, sucking toffees. There was a nice point when, s sitting with uh, Bilbo before the, the night before the party, uh, Gandalf gives in and, and, and has his first pipe for a long time. Uh, and then in the um, Council of Elrond, uh, the toffee bag made a reappearance. Right. Clearly when Rivendell was a non-smoking uh, establishment and uh, so Gandalf had to go back to his toffees. That's all gone. Hobbiton was a very important location for us to find. We... I remember the first day really clearly. So you grab it, you, you eat, and put it, put it down again, yeah. and then we give out call you will say, you know. Say what you like about mad wagons, but no one keeps a better table. <laughs> and cut. Yeah. Okay, there's a there's a few notes about the scene, by the way. Yeah, like they made us do a week of uh, dance and they rehearsals, and they didn't put they didn't it in the movie. And um, extras as hobbits, you know, in this party scene was when they did that um, the dance, and something that a lot of people might not have noticed is uh, I play in the band, the Hobbit band. I'm up there with my. Hobbit ukulele, whatever it may be.
a studio pretending to be a hobbit party at night. It would be great. There's an innocence about hobbits. They don't know about... There's, there's no ulterior motive. You don't know about this mission yet. You're not worried about anything. You're just embracing who you are as young hobbits, you know. So we really just went to town at that point and had some fun. And I remember the day where... Uh... I think that love of the hobbits is really the key value that's at stake in the film. What drives Frodo to attempt to achieve... Sam, ask Rosie for a dance. What, me? Just walk up and take her hand. I'll do her hand before. I think I'll just have another hand. This very difficult task is his love of his people, the hobbits. I was very sad when I saw the uh, the final cut that we didn't see more of the green dragon. I understood why he chose to leave it out, but uh, you always want to see inside the green dragon. It is the master ring. The shadow has risen again. Sauron needs only this ring to beat down resistance and cover all the lands on a second darkness. This was a nice little scene where Sam and Frodo are attempting to get to sleep where uh, they get interrupted by a small animal. Now the animal doesn't even make the DVD version I'm afraid. There was there was 29 takes of a deer sniffing around them and various different animals were tried too. There were rabbits and uh, I think there's three or four different creatures. Sanctum with Simon's last chair, like a throne. Uh, raised up above the, uh, the... The Hobbit cannot contend with the will of Sauron. There are those who can. Why not take the ruling ring? If we command that, we command Middle-earth. A huge spider comes across my shoulder and I, I pick it up and I put it on this log and it crawls away just to show that it's just something that it just infects everything. Now in terms of in terms of this sequence, we definitely shot a fair amount of material for this. I kept going back and shooting more and more different angles. Check that line lid, you happy with it? You it's all right? Well, should we do the hit as well if we're gonna do that? Or are you happy with it? Uh, you wanna... There's an interesting moment in all of this later on. There's a moment where he's with Sam and he kind of looks off out over Rivendell and you don't ever see what he's looking at and we had shot a sequence where he sees me and I look up at him and Aragorn comes and meets me and you see us have this kind of tender moment and then walk away but that little moment didn't end up in the film so. Three rings for the elven kings under the sky. What is the greatest power? 
uh, location work studio. That was good. That was nice. Of Elvish, both Sundar and, and Quenya. You know, have this kind of indoor, outdoor feel. And so what you have are these two people uh, locked in this journey together. You'd have outdoor sets, um, you know, for exterior shooting. So to all of a sudden be able to walk onto a set that was this. I think that's one of the challenges of shooting actors and sets and having a crew costing. You have to be there in front of the camera when it's ready to go. It's going to be blue screen. Who Arwen was and how these the inspiration that we got were from pre-Raphaelite paintings. A funny kind of way for me to be able to. Here we go now, please shooting. Thank you. There's an incredible. The ring of power, it has been found. Elves were the firstborn, so they're the oldest and the wisest of the speaking races in Middle Earth. The elves represent an unfallen race of people. The Council of Elrond was always a problem because it's so long in the book and it was very long in the original cut of the film. It must be destroyed. We actually really struggled with figuring out a way that we could get the entire poem into the movie. We, we did actually film the entire thing at the Council of Elrond where we had Hugo Weaving saying the entire poem but we ultimately cut that out of the movie. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all and in the darkness find them in the land of Mordor where the shadows Sauron himself forged the one ring. Molten gold is mixed with his own blood. It contains his life force. Sauron, you would hold out his hand, and the, and the piece of solid gold that he held in the palm of his hand would actually melt. And then he would, with his knife cut into the palm of his hand, and his blood would mix with the gold, and then he would form the ring from there. Nine companions to match the nine ringwraiths. Nine companions to match the nine ringwraiths. Hobbits and the and Gim Did you hear that? We're part of the fellowship. Great. We had shot this farewell. We actually shot a little bit more of it too. There's there's some more footage that doesn't appear on this version of the film either where Elrond and Frodo have a little conversation. They're, they're just good enough to get by. But in this, every single thing. With the elves, I wanted the Rivendell elves to feel different. Through the Lord of the Rings. She brought the feminine elven energy she was our princess, if you know what I mean. You sometimes had to climb up mountains again and again and again. There's very much the image that uh, people are familiar with, the man striding with the wind in his hair and his beard and his cloak. Happily taken on the human form, that uh, I as an actor was able to concentrate on what was more ordinary than uh, immortality. He can... This scene was a scene we spent a lot of time cutting in the end. Peter shot a lot of footage and was about a six minute scene I think for quite a while. And there was a lot of little bits and pieces, a lot of little interplay between the guys. There was quite a bit of comedy too from Mary and Pippin. Eventually we just felt it took far too much time to find their way into the door and we just elbowed a bit of it. 
We don't go over the mud. We go under it. We did build some fairly extensive miniatures for Moria that aren't seen in their full extent in the film. Well, there's an eye opener and no mistake. It is a marvel. No, my kingly cousin. No. Except for the... To the bridge of Kasadum. Now, at one point in the storyline, we did shoot a, a scene here where you get uh, the fellowship starting to crumble a bit, starting to sort of argue, is this the right thing to do or not? Uh, should we really be going through the woods? Which direction should we be taking? That didn't end up making the final cut. The difference between our background and our hero costumes for our goblins are pretty much as the hero lightweight. You know, and we did experiment a lot with different ways to present the elves and how they introduced. And at some point, we had a, a sequence where the goblins from Moria actually pursue them right the way into the woods and are killed by the elves. And we shot most of that scene. It's never made it into a cut, but uh, it does exist. They're hurrying through the woods, and the orcs are catching up on them. And suddenly, there's this volley of arrows from out of the depths of the forest that take down all the orcs. for a while. In fact, we didn't really plan on doing any for the next five or six weeks. It's a treat to have that much detail. Now, once we get to Lothlorien, it was a lot longer, this particular part of the movie, and we tr it probably got cut harder than anywhere else. This was a nice scene with Boromir. There was a longer version again than this, where he told the story of himself getting over the death of one of his comrades. Uh, that the Shire isn't invulnerable. It just thinks it is. But it, too, should actually bear some part of the, the pain and the casualties of Middle-earth. I'm alone. Even the smallest person can change the course of the future. Now, the, the Fellowship leaving Lothlorien at the uh, Silverload, this was a much bigger scene originally, uh, full of all sorts of pageantry and elf magic.
we originally shot exactly what's in the book where Frodo looks in various directions and he sees uh, trolls coming out of the mountains and he sees orcs and he sees the, the ships, the pirate ships coming up the river and we filmed Frodo but we never actually completed the effect shots. Vigo has totally... It shouldn't be surprising if the first cut that we present gets an R rating. The ultimate adventure story. In the story, that's part of who he is. I mean, his. Now, this whole fight was actually the only real ratings challenge, this reel and this fight. Right, we cut down a lot of things yeah. uh, to, to get our rating. Four months after we started shooting. That plan actually changed. At this shot here, in the theatrical version, he shot three arrows, and we had a version, it was originally conceived as a nine arrow shot, which, you know, it takes forever. And Peter thought it was a pretty cool gag, and I know he loves the shot, so we um, went to a six arrow kind of intermediate version for the DVD. We shot more fighting on Ammon Hen than what appeared obviously in the theatrical version and I put a little bit of it back here. We still shot more than what you're even seeing here but there was a couple of nice little fight moments that we trimmed. As though it is part of your body, I mean, it's an extension of your, your arm and, uh, and we all took great pride in that. We actually ended up shooting this twice, didn't we? We, yeah. we shot a version of it where we made it much more of an action climax. Urukai came up from under the boat, reached up and pulled Frodo out of the boat. And they went and they had this battle underwater and Frodo was just about dying. In the struggle, the ring slips off of uh, Frodo's neck and somehow, you know, gets down in the water. And Uruk, captivated by the ring, goes for it and is so obsessed with it that he actually drowns himself trying to get the ring. And Sam is able to, to, to you know, to whack the and somehow get Frodo out of the water. We can't get their know-how. Uh, originally the orcs were not met by the Urukai at this point, they, they were met later at night, but in order to keep the story moving, they were brought in here at this point instead. We were kind of running across this terrain and standing and pointing and, you know, had a bag of chocolates. Or up this hill or on the edge of this cliff or something. And then you'd hear action and you'd hear this sound of a helicopter somewhere and we'd be running and all of a sudden this helicopter would just go, whoo, come over the hill and be right on. This scene here is actually an assembly of three different scenes. There were going to be two camps at night to show the passing of time. The Uruks were going to rest up, they were going to um, have a bit of dialogue, then they were going to run again, and then there'd be another scene at night the following day. And then the scene that um, has the attack where the horsemen arrive was yet another scene that was, going to, well, was supposed to be a night or two later. We kind of went through the two days it was of shooting them running, literally with them in a huge amount of pain. John! These hawk boys have my 
like your appetites. I picked them clean. Oh, even more nuggets. And then Peter also wanted some tracking shots of Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli going across the plane, shot from a helicopter. And I run up the hill. He walks abroad, they say. He actually turned that into performance. I mean, he stayed in the character of Aragorn. He was letting that pain feed and drive his performance, which is pretty amazing. The shots where the uh, hobbits are, are sort of escaping, it's actually a lot longer the way we shot it, and it, it, it was going to be this one continuous shot where you sort of follow these, the, the two hobbits around, so it was one continuous shot, which was really neat to look at. Shadow facts. Looked magnificent and seemed to know he did. There is a union now between the two towers, Orthanc and Baladur. War is upon us. as a faithful steward. The worm tongue see, see, spits on Aragorn's hand. We took the close-up of the ring out. Saruman's forces have begun their attack. He is using Saruman to destroy your people. Their village was attacked by Dunlendings. Open war is upon you, whether you'd risk it or not. There is actually footage that we shot that has a young Aragorn and Arwen frolicking together in the woods, but no one's ever seen it, and mm. I don't think it's going to make it into any movie, any DVD. Vigo shaved his stubble off, and he's clean-shaven, and he's supposed to be young, and the two of them are bounding around the trees together. Well, um, actually, it's shooting the moment he first saw her. Yeah, maybe in the 50th anniversary box set. We can put it in somewhere. Wouldn't it be fun to do an edit of all three films in chronological order? You'll put that scene right yeah. after the council meeting. Well, you could, that's right. 
The alliance between men and elves is over. We must stand alone in the war is to come. The centerpiece um, action of the Lord, and bring me report every hour. Saruman corrupts worm tongue. He teaches Worm Tongue to sap the king's energy. One of our very early drafts had a Lothlorien sequence, didn't it, where Arwen and Elrond both went to Galadriel to get some advice. And I remember we filmed some shots of Cate Blanchett for that scene, and we ended up using them in the scene that comes up next, which was the sort of the uh, montage sequence. That was about as much about establishing that the elves held him uh, coming from Lothlorien, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. They were also talking that, about that. Yeah. At one stage, Elrond was actually going to visit Lothlorien and talk directly to Galadriel. If we do not trust the strength of men, then we trust to the victory of Sauron. There was a scene originally from um, Two Towers, which was the discussion of what elves, the elves' responsibility was, where their responsibility lay to men and to Middle Earth. And we shot this little council scene with um, yeah, Hugo, Kate Blanchett, uh, Marton, and um, I think myself. What errand would bring you into these lands? I set out from Rivendell with seven companions. Then you were not alone. The interrogation scene was something that used to be quite violent. It even got worse than that, because remember they used to tread on Gollum's fingers at one stage, which is why he sometimes has sore fingers later on towards the end of the film. There was a moment here that we shot where Faramir looks at Frodo and for a split second he has an image of Frodo as Gollum. It was a concept that we had that we ultimately decided not to use. We were going to have this moment where Faramir gets a glimpse of what Frodo would become. It was Gino Acevedo that applied the makeup. To, I mean, it was cool because I, I, I didn't actually have any major makeup for the movie except for the wig and the ears. So it was, it was great fun um, to sort of physically transform for that moment. It was an interesting uh, point in the journey because it was a moment that placed a seed of doubt in Faramir's mind as to whether to take this ring or not. That ended up not making the cut, but it was quite a cool little moment. The sequence is the same as the theatrical cut. We actually had a little bit more. It was shot originally where um, Aragorn's kind of unconscious on the back of the horse and they go past an orc encampment. We didn't use that in either um, in the theatrical or in the extended cut. We had a lot of material for the scene. Set. And action! Elvish White be damned! Ah, I'll just stink from you other miserable cow clanking buggers. <laughs> <laughs> In the reworking of the Arwen storyline, she was at, at one point at Helm's Deep. Aragorn, of course, had a reunion scene with with her. Originally, this was conceived with Arwen was actually more of a warrior. She was actually at Helm's Deep. She's attending to the wounded. We did this in many different ways. At one stage, Liv was at Helm's Deep, and I ran up to Vigo and, or Aragorn and gave him a huge hug and welcomed him back. But um, that all changed.
10,000 strong. In the original shooting of this scene, there was actually mention made of Arwen and that she was waiting for Aragorn. When Arwen was removed from the Helm's Deep storyline, we were able to just uh, remove the mentions of her from that scene. There was originally a lot more in here. There was some fighting done in here as well, but that ended up going. It's a shame in some ways because it was sort of the only fighting that, that Eowyn would have got to do in a dress and stuff, which was quite a good image. People. The armory scene was originally a bit longer because Theoden came in and, and addressed the troops, but in a sense Bernard's performance was so strong and so compelling that it actually in a funny way diffused the tension. We had Theoden give quite a stirring, rallying speech to the soldiers, but in a funny kind of a way it was almost so effective that it, it almost made you believe that they were okay. And, and so for that reason we decided it, um, it undermined what we were attempting to do, which was to build up this sense of dread before the battle. Where is the horse and the rider? They have passed like rain on the mountains behind the hills. These Urukai crowd shots were actually done originally as a test shot for one of our very early teaser trailers before the Fellowship of the Ring came out. And we got it off the files and mm -hmm. dusted it off and put it into the movie. Because we had a lot more footage, I mean we had literally hours of footage of stunt guys fighting. Mm. Are malicious and maniacal beyond belief. We sure would like a, an extended uh, stunt version of the, of the thing, just, just for uh, old time's sake. Just looking at you and just kill, kill. They're slaves to Sauron's will in that sense. They're perfect. They're perfect fighters. A, lo a lot of the stuff that's not in there is uh, slashing and hacking and fighting. It got to 36 minutes long. Originally, there was a thought that Arwen would be a warrior and that she would come with the elves and fight alongside of the elves and Aragorn defending Helm's Deep. This whole sequence here where Aragorn's running up to now rescue Haldir, actually originally he was running up to assist and rescue Arwen. He just gave everything. His commitment, all his At one stage, the huge crossbows section was not intercut with the Aragorn and Gimli's fight so much, but was a separate section that came slightly later.
Initially, it was I think, live through down a rope, and then we pulled them up together. It was quite amusing having us two kind of going for this rope and trying to drag them up. Anyway, I think they uh, painted her out or something like that because they decided that she wasn't going to be in that sequence. So, well, you know, they they really helped each other through that that fairly arduous um, period of their lives. And, uh, and he'll take it as well. And uh, when you're in a fight with him, you feel like you're in a real scrap. And originally, we thought that's a great opportunity for Arwen to reappear and to have another connection between her and... And that's really what we had with Helm's Deep. When we were beginning to cut it together, it was just an attack on a castle. The ring turns everything to evil. No. Listen. Even now it speaks to you. There used to be a shot in the movie where we saw, right after the horn gets blown, we see all the irks covering their ears, the sounds going right through their brains. Um, and also we used to have a shot which would be the actual bottom of the horn where the sound actually comes out and had all this dust and you know, debris from the centuries. I wonder how much of the fight they put back in at the bottom of the stairs because oh, they cut right. out so much of it. Oh, here we go. Oh, oh it's essentially it's still truncated. Yeah, too bad. Well, there was a shot of me looking at that, but I probably looked so bewildered as to what we were looking at that it probably didn't make any sense to anybody. Originally, I ended this movie in, in the glittering caves. So they cleverly um, pulled that out from elsewhere. There was footage shot of an additional storyline of Eowyn helping the Rohan woman Morwen through a birth. The mother of the two children we see get on the horse while the Rohan village is attacked at the start of the film turns out to be pregnant and goes into labour during the attack on Helm's Deep. Eowyn delivers the baby and in one version they have to stay behind to deliver the baby while the rest of the refugees flee out the secret passage so they're caught in the cave when the Uruks finally burst in and Eowyn has to dispatch a few Uruks with, with, with her sword. She surprised them a little bit, actually. And this whole ending here, we actually had shot in the pickups a version of this ending with Gandalf on the parapet having similar dialogue with Theoden and Aragorn. The film is going to start with the camera rushing across from the paths of the dead and crashing into Aragorn, who wakes up out of a nightmare. And then he steps out of the room, and this is literally the first scene in the movie, how it was going to open. Of course, the irony was is that it didn't end up in the movie at all. It's a, it's a beautiful scene. Mm. Don't lose it! 
See, we have Vigo. You're, you're now up front ah, here. Ah, right. We have Vigo, we have Orly. Orly looks around. Vigo looks around. Another wide. And you obviously kept off. off them because I wasn't because there. Because you wasn't there. This was a, a fun scene. Billy and Dom gave us a lot of variations in just how stoned they were. And there were some actually quite funny ones where they were incredibly stoned. And I ended up using ones that were a little bit more conservative. But there are some very funny outtakes. He was only the innkeeper's daughter, but she managed a pint of my ale. So they played that in, in uh, a lot of different styles. Where we'd be slightly drunk. Welcome! Very drunk. <laughs> slightly high. <laughs> Very high. The salted pork is particularly good. <laughs> <laughs> You never actually see my reaction to it, but at the time we shot some stuff of uh, my reaction to The Hobbits, which was one of kind of bemused detachment, I suppose. An opening scene in Return of the King. We do have an alternative version of the scene. We have stuff in the scene that we still haven't used. Again, it was about revealing the truth behind the death of Thurdred to Thurden. I remember Brad Dourif saying, you made me do it. He actually said that when we shot it. As I keep saying to people, we're saving it for the 25th anniversary edition. Mind you, by then I'd be, I'd be so old that I would have forgotten that we ever shot these movies and have no idea what we have li left over. So it's a drinking game. What exactly is the point of it? And what exactly is the point of it? Give me another one! Action! We actually filmed the other side of this, where I am inside the Palantia. What well, did it look like? It was all colours I've never, and I never really seen it, but I, I think it was supposed to be all flames. We had a whole idea of going into Pippin's head while he's holding the Palantia and seeing him inside some sort of a cage, didn't we, in Sauron's? Some, some sort of metaphysical representation of what he's seeing. If the ring is destroyed, Sauron will fall. But if Sauron regains the ring, his victory will be so complete that none can foresee the end of it while this world lasts. He's coming for you. Because we filmed this scene one way where, like, you're angry with me here. Yeah. But by the end, we kind of made up and you said, we'll see the Shire again. Which is in the trailer. Well, yeah, which is in the trailer. The we shall see the Shire again. So you never put in Legolas's poem? No, because it wasn't linked into the scene. There's another little deleted moment where Legolas and Treebeard have a conversation about the elves leaving, which we shot, but we never used it. Great moment for the 25th anniversary edition, if I can remember. Okay. To put it in. Can you remind me? Right can you down. remind me? Just, just remind, remind me of been about 20 years so that I can start thinking about it again. It is time. We sort of cut this together as a, a much tighter sequence, which allowed us the opportunity just to tell the story through several scenes. And so we did we did trim some of these scenes slightly. Action. Hey, Take where's the, the library gone? The library? No, well, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't put the library in here. It's going to be in the 25th anniversary. 25th anniversary. There's a <laughs> mythic library. Now the fans can talk about the mythic library scene. You see, we won't say mm -hmm. anything more. We'll just hint at it and not tell them what actually happens in the library. They can find out and don't say anything about the library scene, no. Okay, no. I cannot escape the fate of my life. I cannot escape the fate of my life. 
Aragorn come to the throne of Gondor. You gave away your life's grace. I cannot protect you anymore. We've put it in a completely different place to how where it was shot. If you remember when Gandalf and Pippin arrive at Minas Tirith for the very first time and they get to the brow of the hill and stop and they look at the city, what was going to happen was that they were going to see this retreat and then they were going to go and intervene. To create Pelennor Fields, we started really early on with uh, Alan Lee. I would climb down a little bit of the rock next to the beacon and run out a camera shot. And uh, that shot doesn't even appear in, in, the, in the movie at any point. Gosh, do we cut this scene? I don't know how many times. You ride with us? Just to the encampment. It's tradition for the women of the court to farewell the men. Point of a soul. Sometimes. I'm sorry, Sam. Go home! What we were playing was really that Frodo was a junkie. Frodo. They had me start doing additional dialogue recording, just kind of tone it down to sort of keep the intensity but not make it so, you know, so evil. Um, all right. I come in this time of greatest need. Every path you have trod, through war, through danger, has led to this moment. Every path you have trod, through wilderness, through war, has led to this moment. Every path you have trod through wilderness, through war, has led to this road. This is your test. We originally had a, a scene something like this, but I was really furious in the scene and, and in the end I think we thought that it was, was too angry and kind of alienating. Also, it was, it was shot inside a tent. I mean, I actually had a line there, and I'm so gutted it isn't there, to wherever it may lead, which was at that point in the third movie. That was what Legolas says. Vigo says, Aragorn says, he says, I do not fear death, and goes in. Legolas was supposed to say, to wherever it may lead, or something, you know, and go in. I was really gutted when I saw the third movie, and that line wasn't there. It's a test of, is Aragorn truly the rightful heir to the throne of Gondor? And secondly, does Aragorn actually want to accept that? challenge. Does he want to be king of Gondor? This was a longer sequence uh, than in the original shooting. So we've extended the beginning of this scene a little bit, but there was a little bit that we didn't put in, which is um, them finding a skeleton with a, with a torch. And Vigo um, did a little film with a flint and got the torch going. There's a whole other creative tool that you can use to... Suddenly these things go flying over. They don't know what these things are. They're like black shapes coming towards them, so they could be rocks. Terror is their weapon.
that they're all actually in front of the camera <laughs> it does make you say, oh my God, how are we going to get through this day? Peace out, right. Uh, Gino being Gino was struggling with menacing. Who are you to deny us passage? Who is he? Who is he? I tell you who he is. Oh, nasty. What do I do now? What do I do? There was actually some shots which get cut out where I'm actually really going at Dennis or punching him and that sequence had originally gone longer. Yeah, and then it got it got trimmed back for ratings issues. Pelinor Fields was just huge. In one of the earlier versions, there were so many shots of Mimico taking arrows. We actually didn't use those shots in the extended cut either. There was another shot where an arrow went into oh, a I know, yeah, no. eye, which was horrible, but that, that one didn't survive either. Uh, ultimately, there are compromises occasionally to make sure you deliver on the dates. And you can get... <laughs> She kind of runs towards the Nazgul to defend her uncle and stands on the horse. <laughs> Adds her weight to the pressure on my broken body. I think they cut that out, but we did it. Be gone, Lord of Carrion! Lawrence? When they saw footage, thought, does Sauron show up at the battle, doesn't he? You fool. No man can kill me. Die now. 
I think at the end of the day... That morning star about to crush her, and we had to just keep on shooting it until he got that moment. Director Peter Jackson will keep shooting battle scenes until they match his imagination. It is gritty physical labor, punctuated with moments of... We had a truck every day on set called the Gore Truck, specifically there to supply all the gore and the guts for the battle scenes, but it's quite interesting the way Pete's cut, it doesn't look as gruesome as we were expecting. But ultimately, being the rating that it is, a lot of it can't be seen, but it's all archived away somewhere so that one day uh, maybe Pete will do an R18 cut of the film. Two thousand three hundred and fifty shooting days in all. It ended actually as it does in the book with him saying, I wish I could have seen Aemir one last time. In the very first go round, she was a lot more weepy, a lot more distraught. The earlier scene we'd shot, she was quite tearful all the way through. In principle photography, we actually shot this in a different way. We shot a sequence of Mary kind of stumbling around, still semi-conscious, and, and Pippin coming over, and he, he kind of puts his arm around him and takes him off camera. We did have a, um, a bit where Sam going past the Watchers too. The Watchers are those statues at the gate who emit a sort of a weird kind of a psychic barrier that um, he has to break through, and, which I thought about putting in the, the extended cut and I ultimately didn't. Maybe one day for the 25th anniversary edition we can, we can put that in, we'll start, keep that one up our sleeve. I think what's great about the DVD commentary is if real fans object to the fact that things are missing, you can always mention, oh yeah, we shot it. And for reasons of pacing or time, you know, we just could not fit it in. The ring will come to him sooner or later. Even now he's chasing it or hunting for it. He has suffered a defeat, yes, but behind the walls of Mordor, our enemy is regrouping. Bollocks. <laughs> We've run out of time. Either Frodo destroys the ring or we face Sauron's victory. One wrong turn, one small delay, will seal the doom of us all. He has gone unchallenged long enough. This was the last day of shooting. This was done in the morning on our very last day of principal photography. Yeah, this, and your um, very so. last thing in the afternoon was him putting on the coat, wasn't it? The saw, which I'd never put in the movie. Yeah, the mm -hmm. last thing that I shot in the movie. It doesn't appear in the extended cut either. No helmet, listen, no gloves. We did talk about a heavy arm. The very last thing I directed um, as part of the principal photography of Lord of the Rings in the end of 2000 was a scene that didn't actually make it into the movie. It was a little moment, a montage moment, of Vigo putting on the sort of his new armor. It's not really armor, but it's the leather jerkin and the chain mail and things that he wears as the king. Kate and Dave are going to dress Aragorn. It was kind of like a gift to Weta and a nice acknowledgement of Weta having two guys who had worked every single day, worked their asses off getting us ready for battle, getting to have them on film, doing what they did. They were being Weta guys, putting my stuff on. Embroidered on it. You're being watched. Let the Lord of the Black Land come forth. The free peoples of Middle Earth demand he come forth. The halfling's release, Gondor and all its lands, shall pay tribute to Mordor. The 
moment where Aragorn is dismounted and they're all standing there vastly outnumbered. And this blinding bright light shines on us, which blinds, you know, everyone except Aragorn at a certain moment sees something and walks toward it. It was Anatar, which is the representation of Sauron as he is in his true angelic form. In a way, he's got to be feeling a bit nervous. He hasn't been able to find the ring, and he comes forward in this guise of seduction and beauty. stabbed the witch king in the knee a couple of scenes before which deadens his arm which is why he's got his it's arm shame. hurt and in yeah, the shot we just done an orc has also hit him in the shoulder so boom he's fallen down and we think we're going to lose the battle but do we of course we need to tune in to find out have it to you you knave and he falls down and then he dies doing battles is like um you can rehearse something, but every time you do it, something changes, and the cameras are always in different places. So and it became apparent to us that we had to reduce the length of the battle at the Black Gates. In armour, um, who was not much taller than Vigo. And what we originally shot was, you know, three days of fighting. This whole, you know, knockdown dragout with Sauron. We did do Elijah in a transformation prosthetic that's ultimately not in the film. When Pete actually shot it, and he went for it, the very first time he, sh he shot it, it did feel as if Frodo was killing uh, Schmeagel and Gollum. We didn't have him laughing, there were just little, there were little smiles, weren't there, at one stage. Mm. There was a choice of either going for more for a smile or for a bit of laughter. We actually shot little epilogue bits for the other characters that we never used, and I'm not using it in the extended cut either, but we did a little bit of showing what happened to Legolas, to Gimli, to Faramir and Eowyn. Originally it was conceived as part of a montage, and then you saw Gimli in the mines below, um, Helm's Deep, and you saw Legolas in the forest. We, we actually reduced it down a lot to what it was. It was actually quite a lot longer.
What if they include that great shot on the, the hilltop? No, oh, they don't. There was a great shot of the hobbits when the initially when they would pull out of the map, they would go to a shot that we did in the pickups of the four hobbits riding up on top of a hill that overlooked the Shire. And I really love that because it they had the full perspective of their homeland stretching out before them. It was then that they finally said, you know, without saying it, we're home. There was another alternative way of getting into which we um, eliminated a chopper shot that tracked right across Hobbiton and went right up to the door. Oh. We did film a bit that um, Gandalf says goodbye to Pippin and I was kind of sad that that wasn't in it. What does he say? I said, do you have to go Gandalf? And he says, my time here is over sort of idea. And he says goodbye. I was kind of sad at that because they, they've got a kind of relationship after the third yeah. one, you know. And I know that Ian wanted that in as well. This never is over. We'll be doing another DVD edition. Yeah, that's right. And then the, the 25th year anniversary. 20, yeah, that's right. You bet. You bet. With even more footage, even more eagles. We. Yeah. <laughs>